Welcome, convention ears, to Spurgevac's first annual virtual convention. And we are here at this moment to talk about the P in Spurgevac preservation. What is it? Who is it? What does it do? I don't know. I'm just an idiot. So I have <laughs> to have experts in here in the room. Um, I'm not alone, though. I brought with me Walden Hughes to ask some questions as well. Walden, say hello to the folks. Hello, folks. All right. And our two guests today are very familiar to Spurdvac uh, members, as well as the radio collecting uh, gig at large. Um, with us today is the premier collector of blues records, and some might say also <laughs> one of the premier collectors of all-time radio material. And he is on my list of people I envy with anger as he got to work <laughs> with the one and only Groucho Marx. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. John Tefteller. Oh, that's a good introduction. Thank you so much. <laughs> Not genuine anger, just just enough of going like, I was born too late. Um, um, yeah, and, I was almost born too late. I did all that when I was like 16, 17 years old. So. Which is which is an astounding feat. And with within that Jungian crew, we also have with us the current wizard of preservation at Spurdvac, currently working very hard and making sure that those discs sound nice and clean. Ladies and gentlemen, you know him, you love him, Mr. Corey Harker. Uh, thank you, Zach, and uh, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but well, a lovely panel, and I think we're going to get started with a question that I, I, I kind of want to give people a sense um, out there, both in the membership and people who might be joining us for the first time. I would like to know exactly what that full history of preservation is where does it truly begin does it really begin in the 70s or does it have an earlier origin point preservation and in, in terms of who in terms of uh, <laughs> I in mean, terms I of started in 19 okay, yeah i started in 1971 mm -hmm. but there were other collectors before me jerry hendigas was one marty halpern was one frank brzee was one um, Dave Golden from the East Coast. There's there's a number of them that that were there before me. Um, I just started in '71. So, and how did you get into it, John? How did you? Like, well, I got into it through, through yeah. I got into it through records, um, through through records and through film comedy because I was a big fan of uh, crazy music like Spike Jones and uh, Stan Freeberg stuff and all that. And I was a fan of comedy movies, Laurel and Hardy, Marx Brothers, Chaplin, all those things. And I discovered in 1971, when I was like 12 or 13, that all those people were on radio way before I was born. And I thought <laughs> that was pretty cool. And I wanted to hear everything that they did on radio. Well, the names I mentioned, most of those people didn't do a whole lot of radio. They did some, but not a whole lot. But I was uh, immediately fascinated with the idea of trying to find those radio programs with those people on it. And along the way, I got to listen to other radio programs with not those classic film comedians, but more radio comedy, uh, radio drama, radio horror, whatever. And I started liking all that, too. So then I just started collecting everything which mm -hmm. is typical for what I do. I don't just do anything small. If I collect something, I collect everything and fill up a building <laughs> with it. So, <laughs> just nice, the way, nice, that, nice just, warehouse. <laughs> just Yeah, well, I have one, literally, and, and I'm sitting in it right now talking to you. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's, that's how I got started in it. I joined Spurdvac. I'm member number 116. I joined Spurdvac in, I think, June of 1975, after attending some meetings prior to that, I didn't officially join till June of 1975, but I am still member 116 and have kept up my dues every year since 1975. Um, and then in 1977 or so, I volunteered to start the Spurdvac Archives Library, which I wanted to create a library of entirely 
first generation material because I just liked the way the stuff sounds when it sounds good and I didn't like it when it didn't sound good so mm -hmm. I wanted a yes. place where it could all be in good sound and then put together an archive for Spurdvac of transcription discs that would get transferred for the members and could be shared among the membership and back in those early days there was a lot of controversy about that because the radio people that were still alive, and there were plenty of them in 1977, were not so keen on people buying, selling, and trading their radio programs from 30 years later. Some of them were okay with it, but a lot of them were not okay with it, and they were uh, very sue happy if, if they thought you were basically depriving them of royalties that they could get on performances they made 30 years prior. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is there was, there was a bunch of legal entanglements and not anything really crystal clear as to what could and couldn't be done. So we set up the archives library in such a way that if you were to check out material from the archives library, you had to sign a little waiver that said you wouldn't take that and go turn it over to the people that were selling radio shows out of the back of Popular Mechanics and all those different places where they were selling radio shows. Of course, it was the honor system. We we couldn't really enforce it, but what it did was it made the potential donors comfortable that if they gave us transcription discs and master tapes and things like that, and we did make them available to people, it would be strictly, supposedly, to Spurdvac members, and it wouldn't just get out there and they wouldn't be deprived of their, their royalties that they were looking for. Um, it, it sort of worked, but not exactly, and it was controversial at the time. Now it's kind of a real moot point because everything seems to be available everywhere. Um, Internet Archive got sued last year and got a big judgment against them, so I don't know how much longer they're going to be in business. But um, there's a lot of stuff out there that's that's free and easy on the Internet. Most of it sounds terrible because it isn't taken from transcription discs. It's just copies of copies of copies. And mm -hmm. that was never my interest or my intention. My intention was always to maintain a library of first-generation stuff and preserve the actual discs so that in the future – there could come along techniques, which we now have, that can make them sound better than we could make them back in the 70s and early 80s when I was doing all of this. Uh, mm -hmm. There's some tools now that you can use for restoration. It's a lot easier to remove clicks and pops. Uh, it's a little dangerous to tell somebody to do that because if they don't do it properly, they wind up with all kinds of weird artifacts and all kinds of crazy stuff starts happening. But if you know what you're doing, like Corey does, then you can create a pretty darn good sounding transfer these days. And that's part of the reason to preserve the transcription discs themselves because a lot of places, even now, will simply get transcriptions, run them off onto some sort of digital file, and then dump them and either dump them in the garbage or sell them off or dump them <laughs> no. somewhere but they're not exactly they're not exactly preserving those transcription discs and as time moves along it will get better and better and easier and easier to get better and better sound off of them so why wouldn't you want to preserve them but there's just almost nobody doing it there are places that have large amounts of transcription discs, like the Library of Congress has a large amount, uh, UCLA Archives in Southern California has it quite a bit, um, the um, UC Santa Barbara now has all the, the material from Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters, and so they have quite a bit there, but none of these places are really doing anything with them. They're just sort mm -hmm. of leaving them sit on a shelf. Hopefully they're in air-conditioned, climate-controlled areas, but I don't know. I think the Library of Congress is. I don't know about UCLA or UC Santa Barbara, but I think they are. But in any case, at least they're not deteriorating further if they're stored under those conditions. But there's still all the controversy about, well, what's under copyright and what isn't under copyright? What can we, what can we allow to go out to the public and what we can't? And so the lawyers just simply advise these places, just leave them locked up and someday it'll sort itself out. Well, fine, but I don't think Spurdvac should do that. No, and that's one of the reasons why... So now why... I've rambled long enough, let somebody <laughs> else ramble or ask me a question. Yeah, no, well, I, well I'd like to get to Corey's, uh, Corey's little origin with this too, but I, I agree like there, there, that's why the effort that Corey's undertaking right now is so that we can streamline that along. There are currently in Spurdvac's um, uh, 
at a FLAC MP3 library, those are currently being reorganized and recataloged by myself. But Corey is in the process of going through all of our inventory and getting it uh, cleaned up and properly preserved onto new digital formats. And Corey, I, right. I want to... And I wanna... then you got to store the original transcriptions in mm -hmm. some kind of climate-controlled cool place, or they're just going to deteriorate and be de be useless in a few years. Which yeah. I can I which I can say that is something that's not only actively in the works, but it looks like I've got a plane ride there to lift some boxes here in the next two months. So I'm oh, excited. Oh, they got you too, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, on that note, though, Corey, I want to know about your origin story because, like, it, you from the moment I've met you, we've had some very interesting chats about not just radio you've been preserving, but also some film stuff that has me watering at the mouth as a Jack Benny fan. But what is your, like, what, what gets you interested in this? Is it, is it a love of old time radio or does it have another like origin point, like music or something like that? It, you know, I, I do have a great love of music. In fact, my music tastes vary quite a bit. Um, but as far as this goes, it's all about old time radio. And, it, and it, there's one person, of course, I can thank for that. Inadvertently, he didn't know it at the time, uh, but he found it out later on. John Dunning got me involved um, just by happenstance. I happened upon his show. I lived in the Denver area at the time. I was actually up north of Fort Collins. Mm -hmm. But um, so that's what got me into the hobby to begin with. And then I started buying a lot of those LPs and cassettes out of the back of magazines like Alfred Hitchcock and all that. Um, similar to what John was doing when he was that age. I think I was 10, I believe. But um, so I just, uh, from there, I started, you know, recording stuff off of the air or buying commercial releases. And then I found out about the RHAC in Colorado, which was basically the Colorado version of Spurback, um, and joined there and Part or partook in their library and whatnot and was able to get some nice quality material from there. Uh, a lot of that material came from Buyer's Group that John Dunning was in and Barrett Benson. So that's why their library had a pretty decent sound all the way through. Um, and then, of course, I came upon Sportback and the Archives Library and uh, knew that radio could sound good. It didn't have to sound bad. And that's one thing that John Dunning, when I did finally meet him, impressed upon me. He's like, you don't have to collect everything. Just collect the stuff you know is going to be good. And mm. I'm like, to me, that, that was kind of like one of those things is like, you know what? He's right. Because there is a lot of stuff out there that's unlistenable. Just because people didn't take care of it or they didn't know how to do it, you know, in the early days as far as transferring to tape or, or whatnot. But that's how my whole thing went on to striving for good sound and trying to preserve it for myself. And then now, of course, as, as we go along here with Spurback for all of our members, the best sounding material we can because the technology is there now to at least make it, you know, listenable. Um, even discs that do have some damage and we do have some out of storage that we're working on um, can be cleaned up. And as John said, you know, it, it's all about doing the processing correctly and not overdoing it. Because if you mm -hmm. overdo it, it's going to sound like it's underwater. Um, yeah. yeah. I remember, um, uh, I, I, I believe, John, in an interview that you did for Marx Brothers Council, you talked about how the process, if you were to do it, if you were to do a clean sweep of it, like well, like an automated like cleanup, it, you could get it done in about a week, but it would sound like crap. Whereas if you take the time to go through it bit by bit, it ends up sounding far more presentable. Well, yeah, and I... I, the problem you have, though, is if you were to try to restore every single radio transcription that Spurdvac has using the process that I was describing on that podcast, you'll never finish in two lifetimes. Yeah. Um, there has to be a happy medium. What I was describing on that podcast was the restoration process that I'm using for my Marx Brothers radio uh, book and release, which will contain a bunch of 1930s Marx Brothers radio things. Right. And I am going, I'm going to the moon and back to do absolute perfection as far as restoration goes, which means basically um, one defect at a time, one groove at a time. And to do a half an hour radio show might take 150 hours. Mm -hmm. 
So right. Corey may be going, what in the hell are you doing? <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I know exactly what you're doing, John, because I'm doing the same okay. thing with um, War of the Worlds. Mm. Okay. We've got, we've okay. got like. Yeah. Well, or- but, but if you tried to do that with every single disc that was put in front of you, you'd need a crew of 50 people oh, yeah. working 10 hours a day and you'd still never finish. Right. Mm. Yeah. And, and what it, you I want is for- basically, you want to get a decent transfer do some basic cleanup work that doesn't take a huge amount of time and get the stuff out there and then save the transcription discs for the future when maybe it'll be easier and quicker and whatever. Uh, I would think that would be how you would be approaching it for the Spurdvac stuff. But yes. for the Marx Brothers project that I'm doing, it's a once-in-a-lifetime thing. I've kind of just decided to go completely bonkers and overboard, <laughs> and it comes out beautiful, but it sure sucks up a ton of time, and I'm paying a studio engineer to do this, so it's not even not even being done free. So I have gigantic studio bills for this thing. Right. Wow. Well, yeah. But that 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 brings to mind something because of because of that material that because what you are preserving is incredibly rare, uh, and 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 it took a long time to acquire, and like eat, like portions of that those elements over time. You you also yeah. talked a little bit about the overall um, statistics of what's actually out there, what was being recorded um, during the radio's golden days, like basically the twenties oh. is out, you know, <laughs> and yeah, there's almost nothing from the twenties. I mean, there's a couple handfuls of broadcasts that were recorded for the government or for special purposes or whatever, but there's not much. It, r- recording radio shows really didn't get underway until about 1931, 32, and even then, not much was recorded. A percentage of it was, but not much. You don't get into any kind of heavy um, 24-hour recording of radio until right around the start of World War II. And then the government recorded everything. Every single thing from World War II was recorded. Now, does it still exist? We don't know. I think so. But there's all kinds of complications with does it exist, where it exists, and how do you how do you retrieve it? But apparently, most of it does exist from the beginnings of World War II uh, onward. Um, so, yeah, there is a lot of material from the war years and from after the war years that's available. Um, but still, you're only looking at 20% at most of all the programs broadcast in what we call the golden age of radio. Only mm-hmm. about 20% of it at most still exists, and the other 80% is just gone. Mm-hmm. Which is a startling statistic for a medium that was very, very instrumental in creating not just our, our sense of mass entertainment, but frankly, the development of pop culture at large. And Yeah, and most people don't realize only 20% of it's there. Even people who've collected radio shows for a long time, it doesn't hit them because there are lots and lots of examples of some shows available. You can get a run of Fibber McGee and Molly. You can get a run of Lux Radio Theater or Suspense or whatever it is. Some of the big-name shows, yeah, many or all of them do exist. But when you drift into things like soap operas and children's serials and oh, yeah. some of the less popular programs of the of, of, of the time, they were popular with a smaller segment of the audience. I don't mean that they weren't popular, but a smaller <laughs> segment. They're more targeted. Um, when you get into some of those more targeted programs, there's a just a tiny fraction of them that exist. Yeah, I remember looking through the catalog when I first got it to reorganize it um, in a, on a digital basis. And there were soap operas that I had never heard of. And I had to scramble through OTR cat and any other source that I could find to be like, what is this thing? Because the other thing that gets lost because the programs get lost is stories about those programs. Now, obviously John Dunning wrote a whole encyclopedia to help us out. But even then, there might be some things that I listen to going like, I have no idea what this is, and I have no real frame of reference. Yeah, Dunning's book is very good, but it isn't complete. There is no complete book out there. Not yet. Maybe somebody will do one someday. Yeah, and actually, I I think that what you brought up about Internet Archive is 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 a great point to touch upon because I think that there's an assumption because everything is out there on the Internet, more or less, whether through its Internet Archive, YouTube, whatever, that doesn't mean that 
the thing you're looking for still exists. And even if it does exist, well, there's not going to mean it's, it's, it's ever going to be out there either. It's dependent on those of us who are still searching out original transcriptions. And that's, that's one thing I do. Uh, those of us who are still searching out original transcriptions, it's dependent on us still finding them and they do still turn up. There's still some, there's less and less every year because every year that goes by takes us one year away from those days and one more year away from the fact that somebody could throw them in the garbage or, or just let them sit in the garage and rot or whatever. And eventually there will be no more found. And then whatever we have is what we have. And that's it. Right now we're still finding things. My prediction is we'll still find things for another 10 to 20 years and then it'll be all done. And I base that on the fact that right now, the ones that are coming up, the ones that turn up these days in, in, let's say, 2020 to now, they're coming up from the children of the people who had them originally. Mm -hmm. So we're not dealing with uh, somebody like um, Les Tremaine from Vintage Radio having a collection. No, Les's collection was donated to Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters 30 or 40 years ago. It's it's there or it's not. But anyway, that they're not coming from the radio people. They're now coming from the sons and grandsons or granddaughters of the radio people. And so right now we're still in the in the in the realm where we're getting things from the sons. But even there, those sons are now getting up into their 70s and 80s, and pretty soon it'll be the grandsons. And once it transfers another generation, that'll be it. There won't be anything further handed down to handed down to handed down. It might be an occasional surprise, but other than that, we'll be done. What is what for from your end of the spectrum, John? What is the normal turnaround from? you finding out there's a disc out there to it getting either into your collection or getting into your hands for restoration. What's that usual turnaround? Oh, for the turnaround is usually people just call me and say they have them. I'm, I'm in the world of records, as you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about mostly 78s, 45s, that type of thing from the 1920s to the 19, early 1960s, mid 1960s. And in that world, there's a lot of, people who collected records, just commercial phonograph records that you would buy and take home and play on your commercial record player at home. Um, but some of those people also would run into, when they're out hunting for these 45s or 78s, they would run into radio transcriptions and they wouldn't really want them. It wasn't something they particularly were collecting, but they thought they were unusual and they would take them home and then they'd start looking well, how can I get rid of these? Who, who can I find that collects these? And since I'm really, really big in that field and known all over the world for dealing with 45s and 78s, I get calls from people who have collections of 45s and 78s, but along with those, dad or grandpa or somebody had some radio transcriptions too. Mm -hmm. And so when I go out to look at a collection of 78s, sometimes there'll be a shelf with transcriptions on it as well. And I just try to buy up everything I can that I think is worthwhile. I, I don't tend to buy the pressings of things, um, things that were pressed in multiple copies. I tend to look for the lacquered discs because those are more unique. And so I will buy the lacquered discs all the time. And I, I, a lot of times I leave the pressings behind because I just don't need multiple copies of things and those mm -hmm. pressings usually already exist somewhere anyway it's the lacquers that don't so yeah with the time is just whenever i find them i get them basically and yeah. i get them from all over the country yeah. uh radio transcriptions tend to turn up in the big cities either new york chicago or los angeles because that's where most of them were recorded but they also can turn up anywhere because people move, people send things to relatives. So, you know, I found some in a barn in um, Merlin, Oregon, about 15 minutes from my house that were classical recordings of some show from 1939 uh, that were missing. They didn't exist before I found them. And they were at a barn sale in Merlin, Oregon a couple of years ago. <laughs> so they can be anywhere. <laughs> And when, when you, like, I'll move this over to Corey to kind of give an idea about Spurvac's current process with this. But Corey, when you say get your hands on a disc, whether it's through a barn sale or, or in the case of Spurvac in the library that we currently have, what right. can you walk us through that process of when it gets into your hands and what you are doing to 
protect the disks and then transfer them to the digital formats that you're currently working on? Right. Well, the first thing obviously is cleaning. If you got to clean a disk properly and take time with that as well before you even try to do a transfer, because the better the cleaning job, the better the sound is going to come off of that disk. Now, luckily, we have some different methods nowadays and then we did back, you know, in the, in the 70s and whatnot. Um, Ken Greenwald came up with a, a plan. I think it was Ken anyway, that came up with uh, using a tincture of green soap to get That's rid correct. of correct and it was him that came up with it but you know where he learned it from <laughs> nowhere he learned it from a guy named bob jensen who was the chief engineer at nbc for decades really and bob jensen was a member of pacific pioneer broadcasters and he came down to the pacific pioneer broadcasters one day when ken was carrying some discs out to be transferred and they were they had been water damaged and Bob looked at him and said, well, I hope you're transferring those properly. And Ken said, well, what would you do? And he says, well, I'll tell you what we would do, because this is what we would do back in the 40s. We would clean them with a mixture of water and tincture of green soap. Wow. And, and a, light bulb, <laughs> a light bulb went on in Ken's head like, hey, I should try this. And so he ordered some tincture of green soap, and he did some mixing with that with water, and he came up with just the right mixture of the two. And it did wonders for taking damage off of transcription disks. Yeah, yeah, it certainly does. It works great on you know palmitic acid, you know residue. Right. Um, all and it's that. Great because he learned that from a guy who was around since the '30s dealing with transcription disks. That, that's great. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. So um, I use a lot of what he did back then into what we have now with some more modern cleaning technology. Like last night, I pulled a couple spurred back discs and cleaned them. They had the, the damage from the palmitic acid. I used the tincture green soap, soap solution. Um, and I you know used a, a nice brush and scrubbed it down first. And then it spent uh, about 60 minutes in an ultrasonic tank. Came mm. out and it looks almost perfect. Mm. About as perfect as it's gonna look. And, you know, people yeah, think, well, and I've never used one of those ultrasonic tanks. I don't have one, but I've found that if you give it a nice bath and tincture of green soap, usually it'll get about half to three quarters of it off. And then you have to do it a couple more times before you get it perfect. So it probably would be better to use one of those ultrasonic things. I just don't have one. Yeah. Yeah. They work great because they actually do a lot of the work, um, as far as that goes. So, um, yeah, they, they come out looking beautiful. Um, of course, you let them air dry then. And then, like I said, cleaning is the biggest the biggest thing you have to do for any kind of preservation when it comes to these discs. And then we just go ahead and make sure you got some high quality styluses and you check the different gauges to see which one sounds the best and let it go. Um, record it. And we record it for Spurback now for archival purposes we are doing the 192K 24-bit recordings, which is about the closest thing you're going to get to analog in the digital realm. Mm. So, Yeah, that's correct. And that's the best way to do it. It sucks up a lot of bandwidth, but it works. Yep. Mm. Yeah. It, but each file is going to run a little over a gig if it's a half hour. So yeah, it is a lot of disk space, but we're lucky nowadays disk space is cheap. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and getting cheaper. Yeah. 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 I'll yeah. give you a Dropbox account for nothing. <laughs> right. Um, and like, and, and when you're, when you're, re when you're recording them, um, I, I know that there's, there's a difference between just throwing on a replica radio, uh, a, a replica uh, record player needle onto a disc. These discs require a different form of transfer more often than not, especially if they're like aluminum, right? Mm hmm. Yeah, and what would those be like? What what do you, what kind of material would you be using for those in those cases? You know, as far as the aluminum stuff, I haven't come across a bare aluminum disc yet. Uh, maybe that's something John could touch on because I am not positive what you would use on that for sure. Would you, would that be a bamboo needle, John? No, no, no. In fact, you don't want to. <laughs> okay, if you get raw aluminum discs in their original sleeves. They usually say on the sleeves to use a bamboo needle because what they didn't want you using back then was one of those things that looks like a nail that goes in a Victrola, uh, that goes <laughs> yeah, okay. nails. They right. didn't want you using that because if you did that, 
the raw aluminum was just going to get screwed up. And so they wanted you to use a bamboo needle back then because it was softer and would do, and I'll say this very carefully, less damage. So I don't want to do any damage when I'm working with these things. So less damage is not good enough for me. So no, <coughs> excuse me, we use modern day modern day diamond needles, just like you would on a regular transcription. Okay. It's just you have to check the width of the grooves and the width of the needle to fit it just right to make it work. But you use the right. same process as you would with a lacquered disc. Okay. Okay. Well, that that's very helpful because, you know, I know I'm going to run across that sometime down the line and I just... Oh, that, you will. Great. There's some in the Spurred Vac archives. I know there are. So, all right. Great. So so with 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 the process that both of you have gone through in different forms or fashions. Um, I'd like to know if there are any unique stories in this world of preservation that you have um, that call to mind the need for this. Um, I know that there are horror stories out there, things that just get thrown in the garbage, things that aren't transferred right. Are there any unique stories that stand out for either of you gentlemen in regards to that world and what you've come across? Well, there's always stories because most people don't know what to do with 16-inch transcriptions. Mm -hmm. They don't have a machine to play them, and so they either look for somebody to sell them to, and if they can't find anybody, they usually just trash the stuff. They usually figure it's there's no value to it. I can't play it. Nobody can play it. Just throw it out. Or they leave it stored in a hot garage, and very slowly it just deteriorates to the point where the lacquer starts peeling away from the disc and crumbling into little pieces. I went to a radio station, um, it was on the um, Michigan-Iowa border, and it had apparently been a uh, NBC affiliate at one point, and I went there to look at the record library of regular 78s and 45s. I didn't know if they had any transcriptions there. When I got there and they were showing me around and where the different things were, there were shelves of transcriptions with NBC labels on them. And hmm. when I pulled the discs out, and they were like Little Orphan Annie and all kinds of things that are not particularly common shows, when I started pulling the discs out of the sleeves, they were shredding like confetti onto the floor because oh, no. they had left these things out in the transmitter building outside, and it would go from freezing cold in the Michigan winter to hot in the Michigan summer, and that's the absolute worst thing you can do for a transcription disc is vary the temperature like that. If it's consistently hot, it's not good, but it'll be okay. If it's consistently cold, it's better, but it's bad when it goes cold, hot, cold, hot with the seasons because that just does mess with the composition of the materials that are used to hold that lacquer onto the aluminum, and eventually it just starts crumbling. Mm -hmm. that, that's horrifying. And, and Corey, have you run into that in your time, or have you been kind of fortunate to not have to deal with that that kind of I haven't uh, had to, I, yeah i haven't had to deal with that myself but i've heard stories i mean everybody's heard stories from the the vic and sade run that was just thrown literally into a dumpster and then hauled away in new york people would be ever using them as frisbees and whatnot you know jesus uh, <laughs> that one i haven't know. heard <laughs> yeah that's I, that's well nuts. there's a recent there's a fairly recent horror story i'll, I'll, I'll give you that one Oh, yes. Um, there was a lady about a year and a half, two years ago, who put some recordings uh, for sale on eBay, some transcriptions for sale on eBay. And the transcription discs were for the Robert Benchley show from 1937, 38, and 39. Hmm. Now, I'm a fan of Robert Benchley. I thought he was a great comedy writer. Mm -hmm. And so I looked at these and I thought, well, I'm going to buy these. She had them up for, I think, $19 a disc opening bid or something like that. And there wow. was a whole run of them. It was like I, like 80 programs. But she had part one on one listing and part two on another. It was kind of screwed up. But if you bid on both listings and you won, you would get part one and part two. Well, what happened was those transcription discs wound up going for over $100,000 in total. The reason they did was because what I didn't know until I did some research was the orchestra leader on the Robert Benchley show during that time was Artie Shaw, and oh. his vocalist his vocalist for that time was Billie Holiday. 
And Billie Holiday, for those who don't know, is a famous jazz singer, but she's also the number one best-selling jazz artist of all time. If you go and, and look at any of the sales records for CDs or anything, even up to this past year, and you look up who was number one in sales, it's Billie Holiday over and over again. And so these were totally unknown, unreleased performances by Billie Holiday. And so when the bidders found out that that's what that was, they were bidding them up to the moon and they wound up selling for a hundred and some thousand dollars total. Okay. I contacted this woman and I said, where did you get these? And she said that her husband, who had died uh, some years before, when he was in high school during World War II, one of his jobs was to go around to CBS and NBC in New York and gather up transcription discs for the scrap drives, for the, for the aluminum content of the transcriptions. And he would be given what she described as thousands of transcriptions from NBC and CBS, which instead of turning them in for the scrap drives, he brought them home. And he filled up his New York house with these transcriptions. And then eventually they moved down to North Carolina and stored them in a gigantic trailer on her property. And that's where these had come from that she had sold on the Internet. So I said, you know, you got a lot of money for these Artie Shaw things and Billie Holiday things. I'd like to see the rest of these and maybe buy some. Well, she was kind of freaked out by the idea that a small amount of them sold for a hundred and some thousand. So she really wasn't wanting me to come there and start pawing through these discs because she didn't know what she was dealing with. And I said, okay, well, look, take some time, take a few weeks, try to figure it out. Just at least let me see it. And, and I'll figure, I can tell you whether there's anything in there that's valuable like that or whether they're just regular radio programs. Okay. Call me back in a few weeks. Well, I called back in a few weeks, and she still wasn't quite ready to do it, so I left her alone for a few months. And then one day, about three or four months later, she calls me, and she says, I have a problem. And I said, what? And she said, the trailer was stolen from my property. Oh, and no. she reported it to the police. She had a photograph of the trailer. She had the license number. She had everything. But they to they towed it away when she was out for the day one day. They towed it away, and it has never been returned. We assume that all the transcriptions were just thrown in a field or thrown in a garbage can somewhere and they used the trailer for something else, but they certainly didn't try to sell the transcriptions because I had the word up all the, up and down the East Coast. Anybody trying to sell a trailer load of transcriptions, let me know. And nobody did. And she's never recovered them. So there's another horror story for you. That's, that's oh, insane. Wow. That's insane. The one that, the one that hurt, hurt, hurt the most internally uh, was one that you told on on that aforementioned podcast about a whole warehouse of government um, of government discs that were basically World War II transcriptions. Yeah. They were recording this, day to day. Okay, yeah. I, I can tell that story now for people if you if you want to hear it. Absolutely, because uh, it's a, it's a it's a doozy as well. Um, when Bill Clinton came into office as president in the early nineties, I think it was ninety two, whatever it was. There was all this talk of um, the era of big government is over and we got to reduce the deficit and we got to do all this stuff. And so they, they began a bunch of cost cutting uh, in the government. And one of the things that they <laughs> cut was the budget for a warehouse, which was located in upstate New York somewhere. I forget what exact town it was. But in that warehouse, they had on um, lacquer discs everything from World War II, from the, the few days after war was declared until the end of World War II. The government had ordered everything recorded. I alluded to this earlier in the conversation. The government mm -hmm. had ordered everything recorded, and it was all stored in this building in upstate New York. Now, nobody knew it was there. I didn't know it was there. I don't know any record collector or radio show collector that knew it was there. But we found out it was there after they held an auction in which they tried to sell off the contents. They were looking for a half a million dollars for all these transcription discs, and nobody came up with a half a million dollars, and they simply scrapped them. Oh, no. Yeah. This was in 1992 or 93, right in there. Mm -hmm. Now, there is another 
theory out there, which I can't go into too much, but I'll just tell you, there's another theory out there that there was a backup set of recordings that were not made on 16-inch transcription, but rather some other rather unique form of recording, and the Library of Congress is now in possession of those, but they don't know what to do with them. And I don't even know if this is 100% correct, so I'm just going to leave it at that. Fair enough. No, I mean, the fact that the fact that these kind of stories um, exist is sad, but it's not uncommon. And the fact that we um, are currently at a crossroads with these materials dwindling virtually minute by minute, um, and with that kind of timeline within the next 10 years of everything basically being unusable, like to the point of it doesn't matter, it makes it makes what you do, John, with the, with your collection and what Corey's doing with Spurdvac of the utmost importance, not just to Spurdvac's organization, but frankly to pop culture in general. Because there's this there's this hard line of reality that uh, I, I it, it's it's a phrase that's often heard when dealing with old time radio is that nobody cares. Um, but I th- I've I've learned that because of the people who do tend to engage with them online that if they knew how urgent this was they would not be using those words uh, out loud and i i well there you know. i get it why they say nobody cares because it's a very very tiny circle of people that really do right um, there's plenty of people that would like to hear the programs that's not an issue uh, I have a podcast, and we get we're up to about fifty thousand downloads for each podcast. So, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. there are people out there that are hungry for the material, but they don't understand what it takes to get the material to them. They don't have right. any concept of a transcription disc or rescuing it from a hot garage, cleaning it, transferring it, making it available. That they don't understand. So. It's hard to make people understand that because unless you're a sound engineer or unless you're really interested in such a thing, all you care about is listening to the program. And that's mm-hmm. great if the program's available, but if the program has deteriorated and <laughs> gone to the dump, you'll never hear it and neither will anybody else. But I don't know how you translate that to a wide portion of the population so that it can be more easily understood and people, there can be more people that care. It, it it's sad to it's it's almost like you we need to make a TikTok account showing the disc process and explaining it to every it, to everybody because the sad part is like yes there there are a, there there's a load of people who want to listen and I feel like if they knew and hopefully maybe this is this is one of many different efforts that can help get that word out which is if people knew how hard it is to just get the material out there they wouldn't be sitting on their hands doing nothing. They'd be contributing to whatever fund is available out there for whoever is out there preserving. Well, stuff, yeah, whether, because yeah. most people assume it's all available for free or close to it. Exactly. So they don't have any concept of all the time it takes. And if you have to pay a sound engineer, and I'm sure Corey can confirm this, if you have to pay a sound engineer, those people don't work for less than $50 an hour. Right, and, and then you've got all of that expense going into this, and who's footing the bills for all that stuff? There used to be buyers groups years ago that would do that, and they were buy, pooling their money together and buying uh, first-generation transfers from different people. But that's kind of all fallen by the wayside now because there's all this stuff available for free, so everybody expects it for free. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We run into that quite a bit, actually, and another thing I work with as – Uh, John alluded to earlier, but the value of the programs are still high for the public, like John was saying, because they think, you know, people can get them for free and they can listen to them. But he's right. They don't understand how much it costs. They don't understand the time involved. I mean, there is literally every month when I'm doing transfers, I may do 40 discs in a month but I'm making sure those discs are being done right. Right. Well, that's not enough for a lot of people because that translates into 20 shows usually, right? So, (laughs) you know. The film world falls into that line too. Like people assume any film is available from the golden age of Hollywood. And it's like, no, no, not even close. In fact, a good chunk of them are still. The film world though, the film world has had some really high powered money 
behind it as far as preservation goes. You've got George Lucas and Steven Spielberg and Martin Scorsese and people like that who have dumped boatloads of money into film preservation. So they are, they're way ahead of the radio people when it comes to that. They've got they've got staff. They've got people working on preservation all the time, and they're doing the best they can to do it. They're still behind. They're still trying to keep up because there are so many films, but they've got the funds to work with. They've got organizations. We don't have anything like that. We have a, a what I call a, a ragtag bunch of <laughs> volunteers that do this <laughs> stuff because they love it, and that's great. But it's not well funded at all, and it's not organized. It's just kind of each group or each person does their own thing. There's no centralized anything, and it's better than nothing. But it's certainly not what it should be. Right. No, I, I agree. Do you so, think there? Yeah. Do you think there's ahead. any? Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, Zach. no. Go ahead. No, please, please. Yes. Um. Do you think that there are enough people out there and enough dollars out there? to build something like that, John, for, for old time radio? I don't know. I really don't know. And in fact, even, and I've, I've said, I don't know if I've said this to you guys, but I've said this to many people. I don't really do transfers anymore. I have a bunch of transcriptions here. I haven't made a transfer in a long time. I've paid to have some done for my Marx Brothers project, but I haven't done them myself. I'm just a repository. I'm just a, a, a climate-controlled storage facility, and right. nothing is happening with the stuff other than it's being stored because I don't have the time to do it. I don't have the, the I have the equipment, but I don't have the time. I'm, I'm running two businesses as it is, and it's just not something that I can prioritize to do. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know. Um, my material would be available to people if there was a if there was a process and there was a, a correct way to do it. I've sent Corey a bunch of stuff in the past for different things, and I would send people more material. That's fine, but there just has to be people that know what they're doing working on it. Yeah, and that's a problem too because there's there's a, a dwindling number of people who do disk transfers anymore. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm going to be 65 years old this year. I'm not going to start that stuff all over again. I did thousands of hours of transfers of radio shows between 1974 or 5 and 1987 when I left for Oregon. And then I just kind of stopped. And I, I, I've since then, I just continue to collect transcriptions and make sure everything is preserved, so to speak. It's just not transferred. Right. And there's yeah. a big there's a big worry on my end too, and that is that all these digital transfers are all subject to failing hard drives. <laughs> it's not like if you cut a seventy eight RPM record and you put it on a shelf, it'll sit there for two hundred years. As long as you store it properly, it won't not, there'll be no damage. But with the with all these transfers, even the transfers we're making if your hard drive fails, or if you've got some problem with your computer or however you're doing it, you lose all the material. So yeah. it's not permanent. There was a study done by the Library of Congress, it's about five, ten years ago, where they were trying to figure out the best way to preserve audio for the future. And they hired a bunch of experts, and they had a bunch of symposiums, and a bunch of different things happened. I don't know exactly all what happened, but a number of things happened. Anyway, the conclusion that they came to was that everything should be transferred to 78 RPM disks. Hmm. <laughs> because that was permanent. Right. <laughs> of course, yep. nobody's going to do that, but that was the conclusion they came to. If you really were serious about preservation... You take your 16-inch transcription, you cut a brand new 78 RPM disc, and you put it on a shelf. I right. wonder how much that would cost. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not it's not going to happen. But right. that's yeah. my point it, it yeah. is no matter what we do now, as good as it is, you have to be very careful because all this digital stuff is more fragile than a transcription disc in some ways. Yeah, right. yeah. You have to make sure you have multiple backups and everything. You know. Yeah, backups of backups of backups, and then you have to change the backups every two or three years or whatever it is yep. before yep. they go bad. And it's just a never-ending cycle where you're trying to protect something from failing and protect and keep something <laughs> from being lost. 
Right. Yeah. It's like the CD rot problem that a lot of people are coming into now for stuff that they, you know, archived 10 years well, ago. Well, the CD rot problem has to do with people who don't store their CDs properly. I have CDs here that I made in the 80s and 90s that play just like they did in the 80s and 90s. But you can't leave them in hot cars and expose them to temperature changes and things like that, excessive uh, dampness or whatever, because that will rot your CDs. But if you yeah. store them properly, they're fine. Right. I've, I've run into that with DVDs that I've gotten through Amazon. You'll have one that like is clearly new in shape and whatnot, but I don't know what Amazon does in their warehouses. I don't know right. what the full control of temperature is on any given day. I've gotten discs that just yeah, flat out know. don't work, you know? Um, yeah, well, that could be in the manufacturing process. Too. That is true. Yeah, that could be a A lot of people think they can burn CDs from their computer, and you can, but they don't last anywhere near as long as if you use a standalone CD burner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think that there's a, like hearing these stories today, like the, the, there's another story or the, another like element that you talked about in terms of preservation, but from a different standpoint, but I think it helps sell the point of why this is an urgent issue, especially with the time frame of a 10 year period is i mean john i believe you talked about this on that aforementioned show that you know like if people are going in and preserving photographs of newspaper articles or anything of that nature that is a physical paper format they've been taking those things and tearing them out photocopying them and then just throwing away the source material and that would yes the, the library the libraries were doing that the libraries, the newspaper archives, they're, and they're still doing it. They're taking their photographs from 50, 60, 80 years ago and scanning them into a computer at low resolution and then selling off or throwing away the original prints. Yeah, And that's and that... just a crime against humanity because now you've got a low resolution thing. You can never really have it crystal clear the way that original photo was. And then you've destroyed the original photo. Yeah. And that's a, that's something that I think that if the people who are into image restoration, like they are in film, if they under if they, if they're hearing a story like that, that's no different than what is currently going on with a radio transcription disc. And I feel like I, I, I have the hope that as, as somebody who's not a technician, but just a believer in this process, that if people under if people are outraged on that front, then they'll be equally outraged by the amount of mishandling and miscare that can go into the people who have those discs that haven't gotten into your hands yet. Well, the problem in your thinking, though, is who's outraged? I That's am. True. You yeah. are. A handful <laughs> of people are. But most people don't have any conception a, that this is happening, or B, what it means for the future, they're not into it. You have to be into it to understand it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully the world... To the of casual person, they wouldn't see anything wrong with that. Well, what's wrong with that? You save a lot of space. You get rid of all those photographs. You've got right. these nice computer files. You can access them real easy and print it out and do whatever. Well... Yeah, but they're all low resolution, so you could save space, and now they don't look as good as they would have and all mm -hmm. this. But to most people, that doesn't mean anything. Well, hopefully this is a world where we can start <laughs> turning that around, because I, I I'd i rather I'd rather that the years go on for you and you start seeing hope rather than the, the seeming pit of despair that has been radio restoration over the years. Well, <laughs> I, I see a seeming pit of disrepair, and they have these... <laughs> Radio Preservation Task Force, there's that thing which exists out of the Library of Congress, but it's basically a bunch of people who sit around and think about how they're going to do things and never actually do them. Right. Uh, well, Corey... I, I don't yeah. mean to be cruel with this, <laughs> no. but it's, the, it's a hard, stone-cold, hard reality. All these people that are academics and, and, and professional archivists, they've got nice jobs, they've got nice salaries... They sit in nice offices, and they think about all these things, but when it comes to actually doing it, almost nothing happens. And it takes somebody, unfortunately like me, or people who are doing a similar thing, who 
don't have the fancy office or the fancy salary. We do it because we know we got to do it or the stuff is going to be destroyed. And we get it done, sort of. We get it done as best we can. While in the meantime, everything is just sitting. And I don't know. It is despair. It's very discouraging sometimes. Yeah. Well, yeah. Th- thankfully, thankfully, at the very least, we can say one, uh, in addition to you, John, one other person in this room is hard at work making sure that there's just one more person out there making oh, sure yeah. that this and is Oh, yeah, there and there's others besides Corey that are making transfers, and that's all good. That's all great. I applaud that <laughs> all the way down the line. It's just we don't have enough of them, and they're not funded. Everybody's doing all this for free. Yeah. And and you only do it for free for so long before you get tired of it and say, gee, I need to go have a job or I need to make money some other way <laughs> or, or something. You don't just spend your life recording transcriptions for free. It's like, oh, my God, I've never paid rent in 50 years. What have I been doing? Oh, yeah, the radio <laughs> desks. <laughs> well, we're we're running low on time here. But before we go, I, sure. I want to just I would just want to hear what's let's talk about something positive for both of you. Name a show that SpurVac has provided to you in the past that you've enjoyed. Like, a, like a, it could be a program or a particular episode. What's something that sticks out in your mind is something that means the world to you? You're asking me this? Yeah, well, you and Corey. Like, is there uh, a radio okay. show out there? That, uh, well, yeah. I, I would just say that my favorite SpurVac memory, so to speak, uh, being involved with the archives library back in the late 70s and early 80s, was going to Cecil B. DeMille's estate in um, Los Feliz area and taking all of the original masters of Lux Radio Theater out of his basement and delivering them to the Spurdvac building. Because those most were in circulation, I guess, at that point, but not in that kind of quality sound. Mm -hmm. And it was just great to see them all in the original envelopes and untouched since he left them there when he passed away. Wonderful. Yeah, that would, that would be something to see. Yeah. Well, hopefully you will be seeing it soon. <laughs> well, yeah, right. <laughs> um, no, but as far for me, um, the archives library, my favorite thing, boy, there's so many, the NBC University theater stuff, that was in the Hollywood Museum library. But I think I discovered Point Sublime through the archives library. And what I liked most about the archives library is that there was things in there that you didn't normally see anywhere else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you could just, that was my job to do that. <laughs> yeah. And I just loved it because you would pick out things and I would learn from that. And I think that was the best part of the whole library for me was the fact that I was learning about new shows and, you know, different personalities Good. and whatnot that I might not have had I, you know, not used that library. Yeah. You know, Walden a- Hughes has been sitting there this whole time, and I haven't heard a word from him. Do you have anything to say? Uh, I do, but uh, we have run out of time because we got to go see Keith Scott and Joe Webb oh. on the suspense. Yeah. So I have to okay. say my story. Oh, but, but, John, what I love is, and I'm a huge, gigantic collector of deluxe radio theater. So, personally, thank you for that. And I got to talk to his granddaughter about a year ago, and she remembered the collection. So, uh, thank you for. Save it out. Yeah, I don't I remember. That. I don't think it was a. I don't think it was his granddaughter that let me in to get it. I think I it was think some so. kind of caretaker for the estate. I right. don't remember for sure. Yeah, but, but I, whoever whoever it was was very nice. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking that if we do a, an in person Spurback convention next year, I'd like to invite her to come to the to the convention because she's a, a who because she lived with her grandfather. So that's oh, on my okay. bucket list. Good. So. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, gentlemen, for sitting down with us for a good hour to talk about your, your, the world of preservation and your contributions to it. I cannot thank you enough for this, this time. This has been an absolute treat. And um, on that note, ladies and gentlemen out there in Spurback land, if you see a disc, protect it. <laughs> thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Well, night. protect it and get it to somebody who knows how to deal with it. Don't yes, just leave it yes. sit. Se- yes, protect right. it, protect it, and send it to Corey or John. Just send things away. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, gentlemen. All right. Well, thanks for having Thank me. You, it was a fun discussion, and I hope that Spurdvac continues down the path of emphasizing the P in Spurdvac. Yeah, All right. Will we do it? We've got Corey Harker here to make sure we do it because if not, he'll beat us to death. 
<laughs> okay. That's, that's better than all asking. Right, well, I'm going to hang up. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and talk to you all later. Talk all right. Soon. Bye.